Hey y'all, I'm Dan Hamilton, host of the Next Gen Warrior Show. As always, the Next Gen Warrior Show is brought to you by Chairman George P. Bush and the Texas Veterans Land Board. If you are a veteran who is watching the show or in the armed forces, thank you for joining us. We take a great pleasure, great honor in uh, bringing veterans to our program to talk about personal and professional development. Or if you are a family member, a veteran who is, uh, or somebody who is serving on active duty, we hope that you'll bring them to the show. Please continue to share our content so that we can make sure that the success stories of veterans and the stories of overcoming trial and tribulation after the military are promoted not only throughout the great state of Texas, but across the nation. It is my honor today to have on Andrew Batchelder. He is the two-time Warrior Open champion through the Team 43 in the George W. Bush Institute. Andrew, I'm, I'm glad to have you here. I know you really have an incredible story. So before we get started, can you tell us a little bit about your military background? Yes, sir. So uh, I joined the United States Marine Corps uh, April 14th, 2002, uh, about a year and a half after I graduated high school. Um, went off to boot camp with the intent of being a combat engineer, uh, 1371. So uh, went to boot camp, graduated boot camp and finished, you know, the MOS schools uh, and then went, reported to 1st Combat Engineer Battalion uh, in late October 2002, I believe it was. And February, we were deployed in to the invasion of Iraq uh, in support of First Battalion, Fifth Marines. Uh, so we did the invasion, um, help reach the border at different points for the First Marine Division. Um, then we deployed uh, back again, 2004 to Fallujah, um, the first invasion of Fallujah. We were part of that with uh, Second Battalion, First Marines. And after returning home from there, I went to Marine Corps Base Camp Pendleton, where I ran and worked on uh, as one of the NCOs of the range operations. And then MOS closed down and uh, didn't want to sit at a desk. So I changed MOS to uh, 6174 combat or helicopter crew chief on uh, the UH-1 Hueys. And deployed, I went through all the schoolings from 06 to 07 <clears throat> and through first part of 08 and then went to my unit, my uh, deploying unit, uh, HMLA 169 aboard Camp Pendleton. And then we deployed back to Iraq in May of 2009. Uh, and then middle of that deployment, we had split up as a, as a unit, half went to Afghanistan, half went to Iraq. I was the lucky one that went to the Iraq in <laughs> 2009. Um, so, and then July of 2009, we actually flew over to Afghanistan to join our rest of our squadron. And upon arrival there, a few months later, I was involved in a uh, helicopter mishap, a midair collision um, on October 26, 2009 in the southern Helmand province of Afghanistan. I was one of two survivors out of six. Uh, one other pilot had survived in my helicopter. And I was flown out of, out of Afghanistan to Germany and then to Bethesda and then started recovery from there and then ultimately was medically retired November 30th, 2011. It's a really uh, tremendous and, and I guess at times from an audience perspective to think about how difficult and how uh, traumatic that must have been for you as well as the recovery process. Uh, in that time where you were going through recovery when you were at Bethesda and you had time to start uh, kind of understanding uh, where you were and understanding how to move forward, what what kept you motivated? What kept you uh, trying to get up every day and, and pursue the healing process physically as well as mentally? I think that, uh, you know, the first, the first two weeks I was in Bethesda, I think I was only in Bethesda for about two week, two and a half weeks. Um, and so there I was pretty much bedridden, but that was pretty much my only choice. You know, my choice was either to get up and lay in bed or get up and, you know, try to make my body you know, be able to function at some, some capacity again. 
what were your expectations of you know the service or of yourself after that how did your the way that you thought about your military service did it change in well, any yeah. way during, during those <clears throat> months after the accident yeah so after the accident um i became more distant you know from the helicopter community i think i rushed uh, I think I was trying to go back to work by, I was back at work, it wasn't March or April of 2010, I believe, that I was trying to go back to the flight line and work. However, psychologically, I wasn't ready. I thought... Can you give us the timeline again then? Can you, can you go through the timeline of for when the crash was, the healing process, to you going back to the flight line? Yeah, so I October twenty sixth uh, was the was the accident. I suffered mostly all fractures, broken bones, and a couple collapsed lungs, um, but they were all healable, and I was slowly healing. So it was October twenty sixth was the crash, and then I think it was mid April that I was trying to get back to the squadron, back onto the flight line. The desire, the anticipation. Uh, maybe even some of the anxiousness that you felt to get back to the flight line. What did you contribute that to? You know, I, I feel I, like if, is it, is it like, a, a, you know, I don't mean to demean the situation, but is it like an athlete who, when they see their team playing and they get hurt, they go, man, I got to get back out on the field. Was that right. kind of what led you? I think you used the word to rush your process a little bit. Correct. Yeah. I mean, you know, you as a Marine, I think you're 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 always taught to stay in the fight. Yeah. Right. And the fight that we had was the fight ahead of us in Afghanistan. Um, little did I know that my fight as a Marine was changing to better myself, not better my unit as a sense. You know what I mean? Or be able to help my unit. I was really more in sense. I needed to help myself and I wasn't ready to accept that, I don't think. So what was the changing point then where you went, you know, I think for a lot of veterans, the battle changes, like you said, the battle is no longer on the flight line. It's, uh, it's no longer on the front lines. It becomes almost somewhat of a, an inner struggle to find a different purpose or a way to continue to serve your country outside of being in the military and a little bit of change in your identity. And, uh, you know, for, for myself, and maybe you felt this way too, you know, when you join the Marine Corps at 18, I mean, you are a Marine through and through from, you know, through everything that I thought about myself to the way I walked and talked. And then at, you know, when I got out at 24, 25, there was a little bit of change of, okay, what's, what's my purpose on the civilian world? How do I bring value to myself when I am no longer the thing that I have been for so long and then how do I serve the people around me is that was that kind of the the change in perspective that you had as well where you said okay I can't be on the flight line even though I really want to who does Andrew become going forward right um see I don't think Andrew even knew that Andrew hasn't even figured that out till you know <laughs> 2016 15 or 13 you know it's, it, yeah. it took a long time to figure out but I think the changing point was walking out of the flight line shop into the hangar and seeing helicopters. Um, when I looked at the helicopters, all I saw was a mangled piece of metal, right? So at that time, I knew that I wouldn't be able to be around them at that, at that moment. And so when I was there, when I did that, I just kind of, I talked with one of my buddies, another staff NCO, and he's like, look, you should probably go over to the wounded warrior battalion because this is, you know, we know we see your fight. We see you want to be here, but you know, our mission changed. Your mission has changed or our mission, you know, the unit's mission has stayed the same, but your mission is now changed. You know, you need to better yourself and hopefully we can see you on the other side. But, you know, once I got over there, I was ready to get out faster than the sun rises and sets. So <laughs> Why was that? I think because I just, I think it was, you, you lose the camaraderie. You know, you didn't lose the camaraderie of the Marines. They were only a mile and a mile and a half down the road. Right. But you lose the every day. Then you show up at the Wounded Warrior Battalion where there's more mangled Marines. 
you know, and, and, you know, it's not that it's depressing, but everybody is trying to better themselves at their pace at the only way that they know how, or the way that they're learning how, you know, this is all a learning process for all of us. You know, we don't have, there's no, there's no SOP standard operating procedures for when you're hurt in the line of duty or hurt in combat that, this is what you do and this is how you're supposed to act. Yeah, the healing process, especially if it's a physical wound or if it's a mental or, or internal wound, that's a really interesting approach or, or insight that there's no uh, SOP for overcoming different in uh, in injuries, but you also had to have some sort of expectation for uh, what you wanted to do after the military and, and saying, hey, I, I want to move on from here. I want to kind of put this chapter behind me. Can you talk about that process? Yeah. So, um, when I got over to the wooden warrior battalion, I did, uh, I did find some golf cause they did have some, uh, golf events for some, uh, some of the veterans and I did enjoy going to a couple of those. Um, but did I tried to, play or were you going as a spectator? Oh, to play. Yeah. Okay. They would have little scrambles and stuff like that. Um, for some of the Marines, but, was that the first would, time that you had played in a while? Yeah, I, I had got clearance from my physical therapist to actually play. I hadn't played in the military maybe one or two times. And then um, I got into it some more when I had more time and learned that golf was, I was finding some peace on the golf course, you know, instead of dragging myself to the physical therapy hospital every day. I tried to talk to my therapist and say, Hey, does golf work? Can we use golf as therapy? Can I get out there and walk? And he's like, you know, yes. So, um, you know, I just, I adapted different ways, but along the, along the lines, I was secretly, I was becoming addicted to pain medications. I was rushing to get out of the military. I was trying to get back to Texas as fast as I could. I was not healing myself one bit. Um, and I was just digging myself deeper into a rabbit hole um, that would ultimately lead to, you know, worse things down the road. Well, so do you think that the desire to, to leave, you know, behind, to leave the Wounded Warrior Battalion, to, to move on with your life, did that maybe expedite some of the, what is it, dependency on either drugs or alcohol, you know, was that part of the process? Is that what kind of led to it? Yeah, I think it was the, it was the speedy. It was the, I think it was myself taking myself out of the whole situation, you know, the Marines and all the military, the hospitals, and just leaving the situation in a hole without a plan was the problem. You know, I left without a plan and that's where I got the, uh, I got into the worst trouble. Like when I left, um, you know, I left my support system, my camaraderie buddies, all buddies back in California, which really, you know, threw me into a darker, darker stage. And this is when you had gotten back to Texas then. So you started wrestling with, with some of these, not having your support system and, and maybe, um, being susceptible to, uh, painkillers or, um, other ways to numb some of the the frustrations, uh, I would guess, anger and pain that you were going through. But golf really played an instrumental part, and I'm guessing as well as your family did. Can you talk about a little bit of how you were able to walk through some of those difficult times and a little bit about the healing process and, and how your family and golf contributed to that? Right, yeah, for sure. Um, so yet, yeah, as we did say, you know, I got addicted to the pain medications. Um, I was doctor hopping and, you know, I was on copious amounts of medications, psychological sleeping. Um, and I, in 2012, September, 2012, I tried to end it all. Um, I did try to kill myself. And as I was in a psychiatric hospital, my mother had told me about a golf tournament that president Bush had, uh, holds for severely wounded individuals uh, injured in combat. And so I applied and that was kind of this, that was basically the turning point of finding something that I'm good at, that I can relate, you know, my story, how I've picked up the game of golf and 
it's all starting to come, you know, kind of full circle um, in a sense. Do you remember the first tournament that you played? Can you take us through how it felt to, to walk back on onto the course after everything that you had just gone through? Yeah, so I think the, the most excitement was when I got the, the phone call um, from the, the Bush Center and said, hey, you've been accepted. You know, so then, you know, that was excitement. And then walking and then seeing President Bush the first time was, uh, you know, just to say I'm here and then being a Texas boy and he was a Texas guy and, you know, it just kind of uh, hit home and the kids brought him Jolly Ranchers that time. and um, he said that he, he loves Jolly Ranchers, like that was his favorite. And to myself, I figured, you know, he was just saying it to appease the kids. Well, later that night, uh, we were doing a tour of the Oval Office and the, the curator had said, yes, President Bush, when he talks to the uh, heads of states and the other dignitaries, he keeps Jolly Ranchers in this drawer right here. So that really, really, really made my time there um, that he, you know, really connected with the families myself and all the warriors um so now you know i could i could i felt more accepted you know felt like we were being accepted again in a different group you know we're not in the active duty military now we're injured maimed and you know broken soldiers that are working marines that are working you know on healing themselves so now we have another camaraderie and another brotherhood that we can expand with um so that was i think the biggest turning point can you tell us a little bit about the program? Is it Team 43? Is it, is it the Bush Center? You know, what exactly was the organization that you applied to if there's a veteran who's, who's either looking to get involved or is interested in playing golf and, and wants yeah, to Yeah, so they, they have a, the Bush Center Warrior Open. Um, that is where you apply. I think at the, on, their, on their website, they have, you know, the Team 43 has two different events. They have a uh, 100K uh, a bike ride for mountain bikers and they also have the golfing for golfers um i have not done the mountain biking but i've heard it is amazing <laughs> but it seems like a lot of work <laughs> to, uh, to stay on the green huh and not on, right. uh, on the mountainside yep they give you motorized carts for the golf thing so. <laughs> <laughs> what would you say you know you, you briefly touched on it changed in your perspective uh when from going to a place where you were addicted to painkillers and then uh, the attempted suicide. And then you, you had this conversation with your mom about like, hey, you should apply for this. And then from that point, you go to, you know, meeting President Bush and starting to feel some, would you call it validation? Can you kind of walk us through maybe the mental or emotional changes that started to bring you confidence? Right. So, <clears throat> my 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 situation is unique um as a helicopter crew chief uh you know i'm not the only life we're not the only life in that helicopter there's four other lives with four other families connected um and we had six families in six six different families that were affected by this situation and this accident and with myself being one of the two survivors, um, one of the pilots was actually killed was a father. He was the only other father. Um, so that, that weighed heavy on myself, being accepted by the families that lost the loved ones. Um, and, you know, just knowing in my heart, you know, why was I left here? Why me? And so that played a big, big role on how I felt when I reached out to the families when they, you know, after I had attempted suicide and started to tell my story, people would be ingrained and so focused on how I'm still here. You understand, like, how did I survive a helicopter crash? And how did I survive a suicide attempt? And I wondered myself, you know, why, why was I still here? And as I reached out to the families, I told my story more and, you know, expressed my feelings. That's, that was my healing, you know, as the families were able to accept, you know, they accepted me with open arms, you know, and, you know, that was my healing process uh, for the most, the most part. Um, so. And you actually had a kind of a chance encounter with one of the families who was in, involved in the crash. Is that right? 
I did. I did. It's a, uh, it's a crazy story. Um, I was, they live in North Carolina somewhere and they do some boating and stuff. And I was traveling uh, and I was in Beaufort, South Carolina, not far from uh, the air base there. And I was in a, in a hotel, a Marriott, I think in the morning eating breakfast. And this guy walks in, he says, hello, Andrew. And I looked up and it's the father of one of the Cobra pilots. And he said, and I was speechless because this was 7.30 in the morning in the middle of Beaufort, South Carolina, and I'm ready to go tee off somewhere. And this, the father of one of the pilots walks in. He said, hello, Andrew, how are you doing? And I was speechless and I asked him, you know, what are you guys doing here? And he said, well, we just came down last night to look at a boat. We're here for about two hours and then we're leaving. But we stayed here last night. I was just coming in from my walk. I was talking to God and I said, I need a sign. And he's like, well, here's my sign. So, um, you know, that was, that one really touched me a lot. So there's, you know, there's different things that we stay connected somehow. And um, I think that's been big on my healing process um, doing that. Yeah. Is, is having some validation and appreciation for, from the family members to, to your life now and, and everything that you continue to do in the veterans community. So take us to, uh, the warrior open, uh, take us to kind of even the lead up to playing at the warrior open. How often are you playing golf? How is your golf game progressing? And, and how has, kind of golf uh, aided in your rehabilitation. I know you touched on it earlier when you were in California, but there has to be a, a much a difference between, you know, just going out and, and rehabilitating versus uh, the point where you probably start to get better. And if you're right. healing physically, you're starting to heal mentally. And then you go out on the golf course and you start to see your game improve. Did it feel like uh, you know, one that a validation of, of the struggle that you had been through and then just tell us how it felt to be on the course and watch your game improve. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a, it's a long process for sure. Uh, you know, it began in 2013 uh, when I was first accepted and, you know, I was practicing, but I, ne I hadn't played tournament golf before in a long time. So I really had no idea what to expect. Uh, and so I practiced and I finished well, you know, I finished like top four or something like that and, um, was accepted back. And, you know, I, I just kept telling myself, I want to win this thing. You know, after the first year, I was like, wow, that would be cool to host that trophy or hoist that trophy. And, um, I put my mind to it. I put a, I set a goal and I was like, I need to win this. I want to win this tournament. And, um, just being on the golf course, it became a daily, it became my job really, you know, because that's where I was, I would go out there and I would psychologically be by myself and I could psych draw, you know, work through any kind of trouble. I could talk to myself and nobody would say anything about it except be quiet while I'm putting, but, I'm, you know, <laughs> but I, that was my head talking to me. So, you know, it's, just, but, um, so it, it just, it, there's that satisfaction of, of uh, achieving something again, you know, where if you, if, if you could be down in the depths of hell and rise up as a champion as myself, then you can do anything. So, you know, it just kind of gave me that grasp to keep getting better every day. Um, then I saw, you know, it, it, it helped the veterans, you know, in the, in the communities, you know, when they, I tell them about the golf tournament and they would want to get involved or, you know, just spreading the game of golf for the veterans um, was really helping me. And then stepping out onto the golf course and actually putting it all together, um, you know, that's that was amazing. You know, I put it together, you know, we worked and we practiced and we put it all together and it came to fruition. And, um, and it's been life changing. It really has. And for many veterans, the game of golf has been, you know, something that we could couldn't live without. Absolutely. So take us to then to, to 2015 when you did win the championship. Was there something different about this tournament? Was there something different about the way the course played? Was there something different about the way you played to kind of put you over that edge? Um, you know, I think it was two months before when I was hitting range balls, I said to myself, I'm going to win this tournament just because I was hitting it so well. 
Um, I did invite uh, my mentor, Steve Champion, who hired me as my first, uh, at the first par three golf course. Um, Which was he, your first job, right? It was my first job. He's the guy that taught me how to play golf. Um, you know, he was, he was a father figure to me, in, you know, in a sense. And in lessons, life lessons, and just being a gentleman and a man, you know, and he was there uh, for that. And I think it was really special. And I think that played a big, a big part of, you know, he, him being there and which was really special to myself. So you also, not only did you win in 2015, did you play the following years as well? I did. So I won, they had a, a break for 2016 there was some kind of breakup one one or two of them one one year so and then I had played the following two years after that and I won the 2018 but then lost the 2019 by a shot oh okay take us take <laughs> us to that shot man walk us oh man I'll remember it like it was yesterday <laughs> <laughs> hey are you somebody before before you before you do that are you somebody who uh, are you able to get over those, uh, you know, those, those golf defeats quickly? Do you, do you forget uh, it? Like sometimes they talk about like great athletes. They'll say, well, I, I, I uh, you know, if, if Peyton Manning or Tom Brady throws an interception, they, they go to the next play and they don't ever think about that play ever again. And I always thought that was such an interesting emotional intelligence approach to the game of football, but also can be uh, applied in life too. So, or are you able to get over that, that one stroke or that, that one hole or, or do you, do right, you, you I'll that? always remember where it is at, you know, I'll yeah. always remember and I'll always won't make that mistake again, but um, it was like a one foot putt. It was a one and a half foot putt on number 10 and I was making the turn and I never made a birdie after that. So I just couldn't get it back. Um, but so did, you, did you play second then in 2019 or, or how'd you, I how'd did. you finish? I got second in 2019. Yes. So, uh, it's tough, you know, but you know, that, that the cards were set for, you know, they weren't on my table that day and you know, you just kind of deal with it. You go with it, but the kids will still tell me the kids will remind me. <laughs> <laughs> so you um, can't even, you can't even, uh, go home without, you know, somebody oh, no. a hard time about it. No, we were at, uh, we went to putt putt last night. Um, and <laughs> I'm telling you, I missed one foot. And I said, that's how you lose tournaments. And they said, we know that. <laughs> so it's just, you know, you, you take it with a grain of salt and, you know, you beat yourself up, up bad about it. And, but you learn, you know, you go on with it and, you know, you learn from it. So I switched putters. <laughs> hey, there you go. That's what you got to do. Don't, don't blame the game, you know, blame the club. Yeah, it is the club's fault. So you, your kids love playing golf as well? My son does. He likes to get out and play with me. Uh, my daughter's a soccer player, but uh, they'll all go play uh, putt putt, which is it's, fun. I, I love I love hearing that. Um, I'm also interested too because uh, uh, taking kind of a different approach. How have you've also moved into the public speaking realm? Right. And you know, I just love your resilience that you have displayed after your crash, uh, physically, mentally, emotionally, overcoming so many valleys. And now you've had a chance to not only internally process that, but you are going out and, and speaking and you are telling your story to groups of people. Can you talk to us about that? Yeah, so I'll go, you know, if anybody wants to hear me talk, I'll come talk. Um, I just, I don't, I just tell what I've been through really, you know, and I, and I speak from the heart. I tell them, you know, it's that, that has been my biggest healing process is, you know, expressing what I've been through, you know, not burying it down. Um, I was never big on talking to shrinks or mm -hmm. talking to doctors or other people. So um, I think finding a way that, you know, it's okay to be not, it's okay to not be okay you know, and that's, and it's okay to tell everybody, um, for the longest time, you know, in 2003 and four and five, we were frowned upon for, you know, saying we're not okay in the military. Um, so that became talking about it, 
has really helped me. Um, and then getting in front of people um, just to let them know that we are overcoming stuff. The, the veterans, like we are fighting a daily battle, but this is what we're doing in our daily battle is we're overcoming these things together and with your response or, you know, with your help, with your, you know, support. And that's how we're getting through it. So this is my story. And thank you for helping me get through what I've gotten through. Um, so that was, that's been a big part of sharing my, sharing my story and talking about it. I still get nervous, but you know, who doesn't? <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, do you have any tips for, you know, veterans who are, are, are working through talking about their story or for maybe non-service peers who are having to give presentations or right. learn about uh, how to speak in, in front of a group? Maybe that be just standing up in class and giving mm -hmm. a presentation or like you said, talking about their life story. I think it's uh, the big part is, you know, first you got to write it down because I've tried different things, you know, and but, <laughs> tried to you wing know, it before. yeah, I've tried to wing it right. and I just become, you know, my thoughts and my mind just runs 190 miles an hour. So I miss things. I forget things. And uh, so write it down, you know, and don't be scared to share it. Don't be scared to cry. Don't be scared to be emotional. Um, because that's what you want is you want, you're there to grab that audience, you know, and you know, that's what, don't be afraid to talk about it if you, you know, out loud. Um, but I do, it's just the more, the more and more I've done it and, and shared my story, I've become more and more comfortable, um, talking in front of people. Definitely was nervous after in the first times. Absolutely. Do you stay connected with either the Wounded Warrior family or do you have a message that you would you would give to a veteran who may be going through a, a similar healing process that you've gone through over the last uh, five or 10 years? Yeah, um, don't quit. You know, we we're all in this fight together um, and our our missions change as we go throughout our life. Um, and that's what our that's what our ability is to is adapt and overcome. And, uh, you know, keep fighting. Don't be afraid to talk about it and reach out to your veterans um, and find something you love. I think the biggest thing is finding something that you love to do. It doesn't have to be golf. It can be painting. It can be, um, you know, it can be anything. Uh, but find something you love and make sure you have a good support group uh, with you, you know. Get out and play golf, though. <laughs> yeah, there you go. So before we let you go, when is uh, when's the next tournament that you're eyeing? I know golf is one of the very few sports that we have uh, in the midst of a pandemic to be able to watch. So I, I would guess that you're able to play. And are you going to be playing in a tournament in the next couple months? Uh, let's see. I've got I don't have any big tournaments coming up yet. Um, there is a the United States Disabled Golf Association is holding one and I think they have a veterans and a PTSD section so I may try to get into that one. Um, I think it's here in Dallas. Well between uh, then and now I guess you got a lot of time to uh, work on your short game you know. Yes sir. <laughs> well Andrew thanks for being with us. Thank you for just sharing your story of uh, resilience and also I think the willingness to be vulnerable and that's not just a, a veteran thing. I think that goes for our non-service peers as well, to be able to, to go find something that you love to do. And, and I know for you it was golf. And then uh, just really being vulnerable about people, the struggles that you had, and, and relying on the people around you to help bring you through such a difficult time. And uh, it's a really incredible story of, of, some, of you enduring a crash in a combat zone and then coming to America uh, coming back to back to Texas and uh, hoisting the champion at the Warrior Open. So thanks for sharing our story. Thanks for being on the show with us today. Thanks for having me. I enjoyed it. For everyone here at the Next Gen Warrior Show, as always, thank you for joining us and being in the room and listening to the show for some of the great success stories of veterans here in the great state of Texas and around the country. Please continue to share these great stories with veterans so we can continue to promote the success and continued leadership and service in veterans in our communities across the great state of Texas and across the nation. As always, I'm your host, Dan Hamilton. On behalf of Chairman George P. Bush, 
in the Texas Veterans Land Board. We'll see you next time. Follow us on Instagram at Voices of Vets, on Twitter at Voice of Veterans, and on Facebook at facebook.com slash Voices of Veterans. To hear more, please visit voicesofveterans.org. Join us in sharing the success stories of Texas veterans. Thank you for joining us for the Next Gen Warrior Podcast.